Welcome back again, everyone. Kevin Carpenter, CPP Events, back with Jason Turner. I feel like we just did this. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I enjoy doing it each time. And and if you don't know Jason, uh, you, you just need to go to YouTube and look up C++ Weekly because that's his yeah. channel. It's all... <laughs> I didn't just call it out wrong, did I? No, you didn't. I was okay. just yesterday doing a bunch of editing and the episode that I was editing yesterday was episode 483 and I blow my own mind every time I consider that I've been doing this for 480 whatever weeks straight now. I mean, I'm editing like seven episodes out at the moment because I have conferences and such coming up. <laughs> I, and I understand that because I'm trying to do a bunch of interviews <laughs> because I have conferences coming up. And but to that point, over 480 episodes. So, you know, there's there's lots of good things you can learn from Jason um, and his books, too. If yes. you, you know, uh, your puzzle books on Amazon, as well as um, C++ so best there's practices. The, yeah. yeah, best practices books. That's the yeah. one I was thinking of. Um because I have to say, like CppCon, your books were gone first, I think, last year. They just oh yeah, they've the last two or three years they've sold out however many books that they could buy from me. Now the problem is Amazon. I'll just go ahead and say it was a nightmare to work with last year. Yeah. They're like random boxes of books missing, and then I couldn't get Amazon to give me a refund for the ones that were missing, and I tried to order more to fill in the need for the conference, and I ended up actually giving the conference books that I had ordered for myself to give out at the conference, because I had promised the uh, the conference a certain number of books, and anyhow, it was a pain. Fortunately for anyone else that wants to buy the book from Amazon, you're only getting one. So you probably won't have Jason's volume order issue. No, <laughs> at least we no. hope not. If you order no. one, they come quickly. If you try to order like several hundred at once, that becomes a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but we're actually here to talk about CPP on C, right? Yes. And CPP on C is going to be, uh, so the main conference is June 23rd to the 25th. Right. And... There's a couple things that are different this year, but the first thing is that the classes will be the 26th and the 27th. So they will be after the conference. Normally we have them before. Right. And of course, we're chatting with Jason because he's teaching his C++ best practices class. Right. And it is the two-day class, which, you know, is not the accelerated, which is nice because <laughs> you get that much more time to, to sit and learn. Yeah. Yeah. With the accelerated one that you interviewed me uh, for for ACCU for what was that just last that was just a few weeks ago wasn't it I'm yeah. losing, losing track of time zones and such um, it was great I mean it was but you know you move as fast as you possibly can in a one day course and then uh, I think the students left with basically each of them with a full sheet of notes for things that they needed to go and research more info on because it was just lots of topics being brought up and I mean, you know, anyone of us who's programmed in C++ for a while knows that there's some gotchas, some corner cases, and and places where there is no right answer necessarily. And so lots of lots to talk about. So what was, you know, I'm curious because we were talking about, because the structure of your classes, it's like, you know, I'm looking at the outline that is here and, you know, const expert, const switch statements, but... Mm -hmm. You know, when we were talking about it, they're pretty dynamic based upon just the attendees that you have in the class, right? It's extraordinarily dynamic. It's I I, I can never really anticipate what is going to catch students' uh, attention. Um, mm -hmm. And it's often, I would say virtually every class I teach, corporate or for, at, you know, conferences, there'll be some topic that'll come up and some, some students will be like, this topic was worth the price of admission. And, but I have, I can never predict what that topic's going to be. And there's just so many, you know, we just don't know. We just don't know how people use the language. Everyone uses it a little bit differently. And anyhow, I, I make the class as dynamic as I can to the students who are in attendance. We go wherever it makes sense to go. You know, I, when I think about that, it's like all the C plus plus that I do, a lot of it is, um, I always say like application, I, you know, we have our libraries that we build and, you know, it's like, but our library got built because, oh, look, these three applications are using the same thing. And so then it gets, you know, thrown into a shared library kind of a thing. But the part that I was thinking interesting is like corner cases and edge cases. It's that part of um, the, you know, 
we took an app and decided to try to thread something. And now, you know, you, you hit this one spot, everything was working fine. And so it, I'm just laughing kind of at myself because I'm like 80% of the time it, it works the way I expect, but it's that 20% of the time that takes not 80% of the time feels like it takes 200% of the time to figure out. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you know, it, interesting for you to bring up threading. Threading doesn't often come up in my classes, uh, although I often have students who write multi-threaded code. And if they ask questions about that, then we'll discuss it. But, you know, I, that's like, that's definitely its its whole own topic for sure. Like good, clean threading practices. I can only talk about what I've done, what I've had success with in the past. Never been an expert on threading. So when we're looking at the stuff that you do have on here, though, like algorithms, mm-hmm. uh, so functional programming mentality, that one I kind of like because I've been a... Uh, so I program in a couple different languages. And the thing that I've liked, you know, I've seen some talks about functional programming. And I like that idea of um, it, it makes me think of the single responsibility principle too, kind of mm-hmm. in a way that, you know, you have one function, it does one clean, small thing, you know, and then you have the composability of putting multiple together. But how do you, you know, give me something about your class that you think when you think of functional programming. Well, I think in C++, if you want to think about functional programming, lambdas are the first thing that come to mind. And so I certainly don't want students to be afraid of lambdas. I want them to know what they're doing, what it means to create a closure object, what the state is like, are they copyable, movable, whatever, right? Those kinds of things. So depending on the specific nature of the class, we might get really into lambdas for whatever reason. Um, But lambdas is, you know, a part of it. Function pointers is also a part of it. But really, really the point being this like this functional mentality. I started programming in C++ professionally in like 2003, four, something like that. And there's the standard algorithms in the library. They've been there since beginning, right? They were there. Yeah. That was called the, the STL, the standard template library, before it was called the standard library. I was reading the docs from like SGI.com when I was using, because it was the best docs that were available at the time, but I think they were pre-standardized docs. Anyhow, like, you know, algorithms are great. They're composable. They have the fundamental problem that they are so difficult to use in C++ 98 that we didn't use them back then. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, oh, I need a callable thing. That's great. I'm just going to spin up a struct real quick and I'm going to add a call operator overload that needs to be usable. And these, you know, it was like, we just didn't do it. We didn't Mm -hmm. do it. And maybe people did. No one that I worked with did. And I think it's from my career of a C++ programmer, it's been like this progression of of saying like, wait a minute, like these Lambda things, functions are great. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of ironic because I absolutely hated the functional programming part of my computer science degree. (laughs) It's the only project in my entire degree that I was incapable of finishing. So, and now I've just been completely consumed with working on my scheme like language that I started a couple of years ago. Viewers might know something about this. I've talked about it a couple of times on the channel, but um, I've been working on that in the last few days. I don't know where I'm going with this, but having this functional mindset makes it much easier to use the standard library, basically. And so if you can think in clean, simple, like you said, single responsibility, pure functions are amazing. And right. if you really want to go to the step of actually marking the function as pure with a compiler extension attribute like GNU colon colon pure, which I don't really think anyone does. But if you wanted to do that, then the compiler knows that two different calls to this function with the same parameters will produce the same output and it'll start removing function calls for you, which is amazing as well. Um, it's just a random aside. If you look at like, Um, cosine in the GCC standard library, it's marked pure. Oh, wow. So if you call cosine twice with the same value, even if cosine doesn't get inlined or alighted entirely because it was computed at compile time, 
right. you will see that the compiler actually emit two times the one called a cosine. It knows how to do that. Anyhow, functional programming, pure functional programming, not worrying about global mutable state is great. And those things translate to so many other parts of good programming practice. Like, just stop with your mutable singletons, you know, just stop. Just stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so look, I think I hear someone calling and <laughs> I I will say uh, Pete, Pete Muldoon had a talk a couple years back about, you know, writing your design to get rid of the singleton. And, and I was, it was a good talk and I was able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure that if anyone else is dealing with singletons, that is something you can help them with in class too, right? At the very least, I make them understand all the possible pain points that they're going to have if they keep going down that road. I mean, if you can if you can name a problem that you can have with singletons, I have had it at some point in my career. I've had the problem of um, crash on startup because multiple threads trying to access the same constant singletons before C11's magic statics were properly implemented. I've had the problem of crash on shutdown because of interdependencies between static objects. Um, I've had the problem of spooky action at a distance caused by shared state through a logger singleton, which is the kind of thing that people would say is impossible, but I can show you how that's possible if you really want to have those kind of problems as well. So. <laughs> so here's the thing for anyone watching, I, I have to say, so so there's a couple things I want to add. You want to come to Jason's class. You're going to be entertained. You're going to learn a lot. I hope Fortunately, so. Fortunately, it's after the conference. So, you know, when you get that mind overload from all the additional stuff, um, you'll, you'll walk away with it all nice and fresh. Mm -hmm. But I do want to, so you've come to CPP on C now like four or five times, right? Um, this will be my... At least your third. fourth. It's at least fourth. my fourth. At least okay. my fourth. I actually can count it based on which Airbnbs I've stayed in Folkestone. <laughs> well, so, okay, Folkestone, the thing I love about the conference here is to me, it's affordable. Like, right. um, you know, Folkestone's a beautiful town. It's right on, right on the channel, easy to get to by the high speed. There's, you know, lots of inexpensive hotel options as well as nice places to stay. Yeah, if you're in Europe, it's an obvious option. Yeah, and I mean restaurants and food are affordable. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, I know you're not complaining about the three hundred dollar burger at an Aspen, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or or other conferences in Denver where you will spend more on the hotel yeah. than you will on the whole conference ticket here. I want to say just for the sake of anyone who's actually considering going to C++ now and you've never been before, it's not actually $300 for a burger in Aspen, although you could probably pay that in high season if you really wanted to. But $40 to $50 on a burger with a drink, that's probably about right. Well, I, I ran the lunch program with a volu as volunteer coordinator. We set up the lunch program and last year they, we had it to where, you know, you spent a flat amount per day for your lunch and there, it was $30 a day and the conference lost money doing that. It was, we just did it as a service, you know, um, and that's how it was. But look, I just so go to fly the flow flow. Was it flows flows? Oh shoot. I covered it in my, so I did, I did a trip report about C++ mm -hmm. on C last year. It's on my YouTube channel for anyone who's curious what it's like to go to the conference. And I went to, to Flo's Pies and Liquor. I think that was the name of it. Anyhow, it's in downtown Folkestone. You can get a traditional pie with liquor and mash and it's great. Go do that. And it's way cheaper than a burger and asp. <laughs> That's <laughs> my point. Way better. <laughs> so the other beautiful part, uh, this year, CPP on C++ on C. So we have a complete conference package mm -hmm. and it is 1,450 pounds. And that includes, you know, all five days. So the whole conference, a two day workshop, the speaker's dinner, t-shirt. Um, and I will say that, you know, it's comparable to, to a couple of the other conferences in, in Europe, but it is definitely cheaper and probably the best and most effective cost training that you will get, um, at least comparative to the U.S. <laughs> I, 
I, I mean, personally, it seems like an obvious choice. If you particularly, I've gotten so many messages from people that are like, I would love to have training at your company, but my company won't do this. And in fact, I was just talking to one person who is like a year between messages. He's like, no, sorry, my company can't afford to bring you in, basically. And then he sends me another message and says, oh, I have a personal training budget and I'm considering which conference to go to. And I actually honestly said that I thought Seals Plus on Sea was the obvious answer um, for that and you come do a workshop and everything. Yeah. And so um, so come take Jason's workshop, C++ on C. You know, I live in Arizona, so I'm going to be happy to not be in the desert and to be in the UK for that time of June. Um, the weather's beautiful. <laughs> well, it's certainly not going to be as hot as it is in Arizona. Although last year we got quite the, well, by my standards, basically a monsoon that came through. It was, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty exciting weather for a day or so there. Yeah, that, well, you get the, you, you have mountains, so... <laughs> Well, no, I mean, and uh, and 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 Folkestone. Oh, that's right. It was yeah, it was beautiful the first two days. I went on some great runs along the yep. beach. It was amazing, and then like the second two days, it was like you're not leaving the conference center right now. That's right. It did. It poured a bit. Yeah. So, well, I look forward to seeing you at C plus plus on C here at the end of June. Yeah. Uh, well, not quite the end of the June twenty third. Close um, enough. Yeah. Oh, and I'm giving a talk. Yeah. Oh, and so you are. <laughs> okay. Give us a highlight of the talk because it was something about missing symbols or hidden symbols. And it's the power and pain, uh, promise and pain of hidden symbols. And those of you who are watching this and have done Visual Studio development, you've dealt with hidden symbols. That's the default. You have to explicitly export every symbol from your DLL. Oh. Okay. If you're not a Windows developer, which very, I think on like percentage wise, almost no one who comes to conferences is Windows developers, like everyone else <laughs> is Linux and Mac OS and stuff. Um, the you, you don't. You're used to just this laissez-faire, like, oh, of course, everything's default visible. But I will tell you in my talk that there is potentially a lot to be gained by going with the, the default hidden and um, oh, okay. choosing which things you want to export. That'll be interesting to, to hear. And I will say, like, I gave a, uh, one of the last talks that I gave, I made the mistake of not having enough Visual Studio examples. <laughs> and it was brought up to me that not everybody's just Linux and Mac. So... Yeah. I think they just hide in the crowd, you know. No, I mean they're there, but it's it's a it's a low percentage anyhow. Yeah. I think. Well, <laughs> well, we look forward to the talk, look forward to the class, and I'll see you in uh, Folkestone. See you there. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.